Good Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. We've got um, over 200 people who've registered for this webinar from all over the world. So if you really want to see the body of Christ in action, just take a look around at where everybody's from coming here to be able to together dive into the word, dive into the scriptures. And we're so glad that you've decided to come be part of this with us. My name is Mark Ray. I am Vice President of Community Development here at Grace School of Theology. I'm also the Executive Director of the Grace Center for Spiritual Development, which is bringing you this webinar. And we're so excited that you're gonna be a part of this webinar with us. Just to make sure you're in the right place at the right time, this is Exegesis 101, why every believer needs to learn proper exegesis. Now, let me make sure that you do not get um, this, this doesn't become off-putting because we put that little word exegesis in there. The guy who's going to be speaking of this is uh, Pastor Professor Jason Peters. He is one of the adjunct professors here at Grace School of Theology. But let me tell you, he is one of the most down-to-earth guys you will ever meet in your entire life. Jason and I have known each other a long, long time. Um, I'd hate to say how long we've known each other, but we've known each other a long, long time. Um, and Jason is, he is an expert in the languages, primarily the Greek and the Hebrew, and how they tie into the scriptures and what the scriptures are actually telling us. I'm excited that he's going to bring this webinar because he's going to help dispel some of the myths of Bible study and allow you through this webinar to be able to learn tricks, learn things that are necessary to be able to study the scriptures and bring the truth of the scriptures. Because by the way, God doesn't hide all of this. He doesn't try to hide it from us. He wants us to uncover this and get to know him better and better and better. So Jason Peters is going to be the one bringing this webinar to you. But let me give you a little bit of a um, little bit of housekeeping first. You're uh, on Blue Jeans. Blue Jeans is the uh, this is the format by which we are bringing this virtual webinar. You may see across the top that there's a place for you to mute your, um, your audio. Please mute your audio. Love to see your face so you don't necessarily have to mute your video. Love to be able to see your face there. Um, but that's, we need that to happen so that we don't have extraneous noise coming in while Jason is teaching. The second thing we need to let you know is that at the end of this, there's gonna be a Q and A period a time for you to be able to talk directly to Jason, answer questions um, about the things that he has taught in this webinar tonight. So that's a little bit of a reminder of where it is. And when you do teach, when you do speak, make sure you unmute yourself or we can, uh, we have some of the controls to be able to help do that as well. This is being brought to you by Grace Center for Spiritual Development. GCSD, you saw some of the courses that we're offering through Grace Center for Spiritual Development. And Grace Center for Spiritual Development has nine different ways that we deliver content to you. Our vision is to develop spiritual leaders in every nation who can share the love of Christ, a love that can't be earned and can't be lost. We are all about training up spiritual leaders around the world. And this is a beautiful example of that. Right now online, there's over 50 people from multiple countries around the world. And this is exactly what we're doing this for. Grace Center for Spiritual Development is an extension of Grace School of Theology. We are the non-degreed extension of Grace School of Theology. You wanna get a degree? We have the best seminary in the world in Grace School of Theology to bring that degree to you. However, we also recognize that there's a whole lot of people that do not want to get a degree. They don't need it. They don't, can't, may not be able to afford it. They're not in a position to need that degree. And so from that extent, we offer a tremendous amount of content through Grace Center for Spiritual Development. Could you flip that next slide? Let me just drag you through a couple of things that we have available for you at Grace Center. So, we do seminars and conferences. We've got Bible studies. We've got our basic program, which is biblical application for service in Christ. We have podcasts. We've got our video casts. We've got our Grace app, the Grace app, a free download that you can get all of these resources here. Study guides that we've made available. 
our Grace Theology Press, our, our publishing arm comes under Grace Center for Spiritual Development, and also what's called Grace On Demand, our on-demand online learning platform. We've got currently today 16 courses and 100 plus hours of training available for you. That's Grace Center for Spiritual Development. We'll talk more about that at the end of this, of this presentation. So again, let me say welcome to you. We are excited about the fact that you're here. I'm excited to be able to introduce to you Pastor Jason Peters. Uh, let me give you a little more background on him. I'm kind of embarrassed to read all of this and I'm sure it's gonna embarrass him, but let me just tell you who this is that's bringing this webinar to you. Um, Jason Peters has a Master's of Divinity and a Master's of Theological Studies from Grace Biblical Seminary. He has a, a, a Master's in New Testament Greek from Schofield Seminary and Bible Institute, currently finishing his D-Men here at Grace School of Theology. He has a heart to teach with his expertise in exegesis, hermeneutics, and biblical Greek and Hebrew. He is passionate, passionate about equipping the local pastor for ministry into the local church. It's what drives him. He lives in the Austin area. He is, again, one of our adjunct professors here. Um, has had uh, ministry that I've, I've just, in the years that I have known him, ministry that has just touched life after life after life after life. It is a privilege for me to introduce Jason Peters, my good friend, and I want to pray for us and pray for him and then turn this over to him. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me, please? Father God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this evening. We give you thanks for this morning, wherever it is with those who are online with us around the world. I pray right now that you would open our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes and our ears to hear the truth. I pray you would put the right words into Jason's mouth, that you would give him the wisdom to be able to speak the truth. I pray that those who are hearing this now and who will hear this later will be impacted, so impacted that this will drive them to the scriptures drive them to your truth, drive them to share that with one another. We believe in training others who will train others, who will train others, who will train others, that that ripple effect is a ripple effect that expands your kingdom and the knowledge of you in your creation. Thank you for this evening together. I pray it's a blessing to all who are involved and we give you the glory for it in Jesus name, amen. Well, let me introduce to you, Pastor Jason Peters. Jason, it's all yours. All right. Um, I am so excited to be here with y'all. I feel like I want to jump out of my seat. A couple things. If you see me looking down, it's because I have a uh, a tablet with notes and things like that on it. So I don't, I'm not looking at my toes or doing anything weird. So I just want to get that out of the way. But if you have a Bible with you, I would go ahead and get it out. We're going to go to various places in the text. Um, and what I'm going to attempt to do is I'm going to attempt to give you uh, as much exegetical insight as I can without overwhelming you. Um, and, and so I need you to know if we don't cover something uh, in the actual presentation, please ask the question. Uh, please write it down. Make sure you put it in the chat. Ask the question because I want to get to those questions and I want to help you as much as I can. But but you and I both know that exegesis is a wide field. Um, and and one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar is so that we can also offer more places for you to get plugged in, involved and and continue that practice of, of exegesis. So let's start off by this. Um, I want to read to you kind of a paraphrase from an old Bible translator named J.P. Lowe that kind of, it, it helps answer the question, why? Why do we need exegesis? <coughs> uh, and he says this, as people living in societies where reading is part of daily life, we often tend to think of reading a text as a fairly uncomplicated procedure. Once we've accomplished the basic skills of reading, it seems natural for us to assume that the only further impediment to proper understanding of a text is knowing the meaning of the words and having a good dictionary at hand. When we approach an ancient text like the Bible in this way, we we end up thinking like this, and, and here's what we end up doing. We end up thinking that that the most important part of the biblical text is the word. 
maybe we go a little bit further and start beginning to th and we begin to think the most important part of the biblical text is the phrase but what what exegesis does is exegesis seeks to draw out the whole meaning of the discourse and now when i say discourse uh, it will be a, a word that maybe you don't hear that often when you're talking about bible study i just mean the whole communicative effort of the author so if it's a letter letter of paul or if it's a poem or a song by david or a story by moses uh instead of saying a book of the bible i'm just going to use the word discourse but here's what happens when we we think that exegesis is really no more than than glorified word studies um, we end up saying things like this and if you're a teacher or a preacher of the bible you you want to avoid this phrase what the Bible really says, or what the word really means. Um, what, that, what that shows is that we are so myopic, we're so focused on one word that we are leaving out tons and tons and tons of context. And, and so the very, the very foundation point of good exegesis is context, is different kinds of context. Um, I wanna give a, a quick example of this using the word trunk. If you look up trunk in the dictionary, uh, in a modern dictionary, you probably will find multiple, uh, you know, entries for the word trunk. You may find part of an animal. It, it could be part of a car, right? It could, in, in, even in America, you could be talking about a person's behind, like in popular uh, songs, junk in the trunk. Um, you could uh, be talking about a storage container that you keep clothes in. And no matter how much you study this word, you will not narrow the meaning down apart from the context in which you find it. <clears throat> so let's go further. How about I say, I say, wow, that is a big trunk. Now, what am I talking about? I've given you, uh, there's a sentence, there's context. I could still be talking about the elephant the part of the car, I could still be talking about somebody's big giant behind, if you're at least in America, or I could be talking about a container I put clothes in. How about this? That is a big gray trunk. Does that help any? I've added some, some, some modifiers? No, it doesn't. You still don't know. How about, I hope it's not too heavy. <laughs> do we still know, do we know what the trunk is yet? No, we need more context. Now, what if I say, I wonder if it can store a lot of peanuts? Our, we, we then assume, because of how our mind builds things, that it's, a, that it's an elephant. But you can put peanuts in the trunk of a car, right? Or in a container for your clothes. Here's my point. My point is we have to get out of thinking that exegesis or good Bible study or deep teaching is all about the word study, all about an individual word. Words have ranges of meaning. The words actually only get narrowed in the context in which we find those words. Um, now, here's, here's the other thing that we want to be very, very, very careful of. And uh, thanks, Jalen, for pulling that slide up. So when we're talking about exegesis, what we're really talking about is we're talking about drawing out meaning from something, from something else. And so what we are attempting to do is we're attempting to get the, to the communicative effect or the communicative intent of the discourse itself. Um, what, that, uh, what that will help us do, it, was, it will help us avoid reading our own presuppositions into the text of Scripture. If you've, ever, if you've ever been around people in different denominations, you'll hear things like a good Calvinist reading of the text, a Catholic reading of the text, a feminist reading of the text. What that means is that they've put glasses on or they've put a lens on that says, um, I have these presuppositions and I can only understand the Bible through these presuppositions. What good exegesis allows us to do is not to set our presuppositions aside, but to be but our presuppositions to actually be constrained by exegetical methodology. So we know they're there, and what we want to do is we want to make sure that we don't allow our presuppositions to govern our reading of the Bible. And here's why, because in John 17, 17, Jesus says this, sanctify, um, he's praying, and he says, um, sanctify them in the truth, Father, your word is truth. Right, so we 
our presupposition is that we can get to the truth that the author has an intent that he has for us, and it's our job to both draw it out, that's the analysis part, when you look at the slide, and then synthesize it with our modern context. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So here's two paths that, again, if you've done church ministry or maybe you're new to church and that's great too, there's two paths that we usually go when we read the Bible. One path is we, we are attempting to do faithful exegesis, where we are drawing meaning out and applying it to our lives. The other, eisegesis, which these come from two Greek prepositions. The, the ex on the exegesis is a Greek that means out of, and the east on the uh, eisegesis means go into. So eisegesis is really reading into the text. And it's the, it, it's the, the one question that we want to have a knee-jerk reaction to when we hear it in Bible study or we hear people say this if they're preaching or they're teaching is what does it mean to you? That question doesn't really matter <laughs> because we're not trying to figure out what it means to us. We are trying to figure out what it meant to the church at Colossae that Paul was writing to. We're trying to figure out what the text means to the ancient audience first. Um, as, as a guy named, well, I won't even give you his name, um, but a scholar has said that the Bible as an ancient text is, not, is written for us, for the church, but not written to the church. Or all of it is not written to the church. So it's not written, I say modern church, so it's not written to us. Paul was not thinking of Jason when he was writing to Colossae. Paul was thinking of the situational context there. Now, is the Bible for Jason? Sure. Um, but the Bible was not necessarily written with, with Jason in mind. So we have to understand and get to that situational context first. Um, but before we do that, though, really quickly, just in case there's confusion, um, what's the difference between hermeneutics and exegesis? Next slide, please. Thanks. So when we talk about hermeneutics, we're t generally talking about the theory of how to interpret something. You can, you, hermeneutical theory happens in everything. You can have hermeneutical theory in how you interpret a piece of art. Um, <coughs> you know, or, or general hermeneutics for, for written language uh, covers things like the culture, you know, how, how do we factor in history and culture and, and textual context and, you know, theological context and and those kinds of things. Special hermeneutics really gets a little bit more uh, special, hence the word, into particular genres uh, that are used. And genre is just a fancy word for how a discourse is formed. So you have a poem, you have poetic genre because poem has a certain structure. You have epistolatory genre because it has a certain structure or form. So this is theory. Hermeneutics is theory, and there are hermeneutical theories for, for every day of the year. Um, exegesis is the actual method that we're going to apply. So exegesis is, is what we would call putting um, – and next slide, please – what we would call putting hermeneutics into practice. Now, at this point in time, we're we've talked about hermeneutics and exegesis and context and all these kinds of things. And so – the, the question then would could be this. Can I just read my Bible, dude? If you say dude and you're part of the world, can you can I just read my Bible? Yeah, absolutely. You can just read your Bible. Next slide, please. Uh, and you'll you will um, you'll profit greatly from reading your Bible, from 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 having a conversation with God um, and lit and living out what you learn. Uh, but here's what you have to remember. Um, and here's why exegesis matters, because we're separated by 2,000 to 4,000 years uh, of, of culture, of, of different languages, different cultural value systems, different geography, different government, and different, and different problems. Now, we share a lot of things in common, but, we are, but, but that is a big chasm. And what we tend to do is take our own context and read it into the ancient um, 
biblical text, and that's why so oftentimes we come to all of these different conclusions even within the same book. Now, the good news is the word of God is powerful because it's theanustos, it's God-breathed, um, but with it being God-breathed, it's also uh, – men were also spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it's divinely inspired, it's, it's living and it's active and it's powerful, but we have to stick to rules of language if we're going to really uh, get the, as much truth as the Bible has to offer us out of it. That's where exegesis – comes in so where do we start that that's a question i get from seminary to to the coffee shop is jason i want to be a good reader of the bible where do we start so the first thing we start exegetical methodology is very simple we read and we read and we read some more um i would suggest if you're not reading the original languages that's fine i'd suggest reading different bible translations um, but the important thing is, is that you are reading uh, the entire discourse before you are going back to a particular section. See, we want to get we want to get the big picture view of the discourse before we get into the parts. And why is that? Because the whole informs the parts, just like the parts infor inform the whole. And so some things to think about, and we're, we're going to see some biblical ex examples of this in a second, is who is writing and what is said about this person. <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff we can gather from the biblical text itself or from a simple introduction in a study Bible about who the, who the, um, who the author is, where they were at, what they were doing, um, why is it written. There's practical reasons, say, why Paul wrote his letters to these particular churches. He wasn't just you know, doing some theological musing or something like that. They had, there were real reasons for why he was writing. And so we want to look for the problem. What's the problem he's addressing? What's the proposed solution for the biblical author? Um, what kind of literature is it? You know, the big, big mistakes that people tend to make is they read Proverbs the way they read a gospel, the way they read one of Paul's letters. And and why that's a mistake is because part of part of understanding genre is realizing that a particular genre um, gets to meaning different than another genre. In other words, Paul's letters are structured different than David's poems. And so we want to track with the author and with the form of whatever discourse we're reading. We don't want to read a proverb like a letter. It will make no sense. Wisdom literature is is meant to be read and contemplated and pondered letters are meant to find the the persuasive theme throughout you know say the book of colossians uh because i hope some of y'all will join me in studying that book where we will see the themes and the seams of colossians all the way through it'll be much different but we want to figure out what kind of literature it is um, and then we want to look for repetition not of words but of concepts we want to look for, for repetition of concepts because a biblical writer may be talking about the same concept, say, temple, but use different words to describe that, that same part of, of the temple. He may be using biblical illustrations and biblical language that may not be, you know, lexically um, the exact same, but conceptually he's talking about the same Thing. So we want to look for concepts. And then when we're reading the whole discourse, we want to look for big shifts in theme. Where, where are the, the, where does the people, the places, the actions, where do they change? Where do they change dramatically? We want to look for those shifts. Um, because one thing about language is when people write language, they write it one to be understood. They also write it usually progressively. And so like in the Gospels, it will be a progressive to the end story. Paul's letters will progress. A psalm will progress to the end. And so we want to see where these, these themes um, shift so that we can begin to get a big picture of what the whole discourse is about. <laughs> and then finally, you know, read, read the whole, we read the whole thing. And we begin to just make preliminary judgments about what the big idea of the letter is. It will change, but at least we have something to go off of. 
Um, and, and then once we have a big picture, once we've read through the discourse as many times as we can stomach, then we can go back into sm uh, smaller sections and we can begin to do a lot of the, the paragraph level analysis. Um, next slide. Thanks. So this is just a simple thing. You have the notes of different ways of engaging the text in reading. Um, and it just comes from Howard Hendricks, uh, you know, an old book he has called Living by the Book. It's real simple, but it's really, really good. When you're doing a lot of reading of the text, put yourself in the story. Um, look for the repetition. Make sure you're thinking about the kind of genre you're in. Um, nobody reads a newspaper they, the way they, that they read a love letter from their spouse. So genre matters. Um, read as though you're in a relationship with the living God. Um, read knowing that God, that God is the answer to your problems. Um, make sure that you're looking at the context constantly. And, and then obviously read prayerfully. We want it, reading scripture is a conversation with God and, and is a constant asking of the Spirit of God to illuminate and guide and teach. Okay, so let's let let's dive in. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen with you um, and I'm gonna attempt to pull up a biblical text here. So let's talk about Matthew, okay? And so if you're a Greek person, I don't know if there's any on here. I have the Greek text up and I have the English text up. And if you can't see this, I apologize ahead of time, but we're in Matthew chapter one. And so before we get into situational context, let's talk about big picture. How, 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 let me give you an example of, of seeing some seams that give us a big picture of what the gospel of Matthew is about. <laughs> so in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, you have... Um, the the record or the scroll of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so, so many people gloss over the, uh, the very beginning of discourses, thinking that, that there's no information that really matters. Well, it's the exact opposite in the ancient world. The very beginning of discourses usually whether it's whether it's a letter or a gospel or a story, usually begin by by giving some kind of perceived problem that is going to be solved later. And so here, right off the bat, we have all of this loaded information. The author could have said, "Hey, this is a scroll of Jesus the Messiah." He doesn't. He says, "Son of David, son of Abraham." Now, why that would matter is because if you remember. David and Abraham were both promised things covenantally. God covenanted with them um, and promised them certain things that that Matthew now will begin to unpack. And and when we see and we see David and we see Abraham find um, come together as as the dual fulfillment of Messiah of who Jesus is. And so I think Matthew is actually wanting to answer this question of who is Jesus. And so he starts off saying, this is who Jesus is. Now I'm about to show you who Jesus is all the way through my gospel. And so go to Matthew 16 now. So here's another major theme in, in the gospel of Matthew. So 16:13. So they, they shift the region, they shift the audience, and then this question is posed. Anytime you come to questions in, in scripture, you need a pause and you need to, you need to realize that the, that the text is engaging you to think. Questions are very, very, very important as a rhetorical device. And so what does Jesus do? He asks, who, who, is, who am I? Who do people say I am? And Peter answers, and they have this long confession and, and what does Peter says? He says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And so now we're having, now, now the big idea of who is Jesus is being filled out. And so go to Matthew 28. 
And so now you have – actually, you could go to 2816, and now you have the final theme that, that helps the big theme of Matthew wanting to answer who Jesus is in this final scene where the, the, the 11 disciples um, <coughs> go to Jesus. They fall down and worship. Some doubted, but Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Why? Because I am the serpent crushing, I am the seed blessing Abraham, Genesis 3.15, Genesis 12.3, and, and I am the Davidic king. I have all authority. It is all mine. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I command you, and I'm going to be with you even to the end of the age. So we can hang the rest of Matthew's gospel on these big seams. And then, and then what we can do is we can begin to go, you know, paragraph by paragraph or discourse unit by discourse unit through the gospel of Matthew uh, and see how the, the big idea of answering the question of who is Jesus and what does he want us to do, right? Because remember, questions always come with um, – they call them hortatory ideas. In other words, you know, these documents are written to change us, to move us to deeper relationship and to more faithful practice in worshiping the Lord. So that's a that's an example of the gospel um, of Matthew and how the seams in the gospel point to the big theme of the gospel. Now, you may be saying, um, how how does how do the other things fit in? Well, think about what, when Matthew wrote. Matthew didn't write to Jewish people. Matthew wrote to Jewish Christians. Matthew wrote when the church had been established. Matthew wrote, though, very early. And so we know that these believers, these early believers, needed something more to help evangelize the other Jewish people in their lives. So Matthew gives them this discipleship document to help them answer the question for other people who is Jesus. Um, let me give you another example. So go to, uh, go to Colossians, if you have a Bible with you. If you go to Colossians, here's what you see in the beginning. Um, you see Paul telling the Colossians, already calling the Colossians holy and faithful. And he doesn't do that for no reason. He does that because that's what Paul's driving to. That's actually what he's going to unpack later in the letter. And here's where we see that. Um, we see that Paul wants them to continue to be set apart, holy, hagios, and, and faithful. Um, <clears throat> why? Because we know that the situational context is such that false teachers or believers that had, had gotten off in the weeds, you know, that weren't necessarily you know, heretics had come in saying, hey, there's these other things you need to do with these intermediary spiritual beings. So so they were they were beginning to question who exactly is Jesus. Hence, we have that that long Christ hymn uh, in in Colossians 1, 15 through 20. But the, the idea that Paul wants these believers in Colossae to, to remain faithful and to be holy and to be set apart is picked up in 1, 9 and 10. Um, and, and then it's it, – so you go there, and, and Paul wants them to be filled with the knowledge of his will in order to walk a certain way in 2, 6, and 7, just as you received Christ the Lord. So walk a certain way. 3, 1 through 4, same thing. You know, fix your if, – if you've been raised with Christ, then seek the things above. Set your mind on the things above where Christ is. And then four, two through six, make the most walk, walk in a particular way with those on the outside. So, so the theme of, of Colossians of this believers need to maintain faithfulness and holiness to the Lord in the midst of false teaching is actually uh, unpacked all throughout the letter. But, but the seams where, where Paul's transitioning you know, in 1, 9, 10, 2, 6, and 7, 3, 1 through 4, and 4, 2 through 6, is how we can build out the big picture of Colossians. Um, okay, so uh, next slide, please. So part of, of 
getting the of, of good exegesis is not just doing say grammatical analysis looking at words and clauses and paragraphs it's also being sensitive to the context that's behind the discourse and i just mean the context of which the of 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 the situational context of why why did paul write so many times we read paul's letters going what is the theology that's a that, that's a good thing but what what's even better is to ask the question paul why are you writing to these believers what are you wanting to happen in them and to them and through them because paul, say paul's letters are really hortatory in nature in other words they are meant to persuade the audience to to do certain things and they give paul gives good theology to bolster those commands that he has and so we need to know what was going on as best we can so that we have a good idea of what exactly paul was talking about when you know i've been in the book of colossians a lot because i'm teaching an exegesis course for the seminary and that so there's this phrase that paul says watch out for the philosophy so when paul says the philosophy he's assuming that they understand what this actually is that this is some kind of heretical teaching but we want to try to figure out what that is because Paul gives very direct commands and very direct uh, hortatory comments to not get involved in this. Um, so this, what, what we need to do is ask good questions around the text. And when we look at the text, we need to ask pragmatic questions keep asking paul why did you say this and not this moses why did you say this and not this um, that will go a long way in us getting to the the ancient communicative intent before we move to modern applications so a little bit more um here's here's a quote from nt wright about context next slide please So he says this, we must, in other words, ask questions such as the following. How does Paul relate to the larger Jewish worldviews of his day? You know, as far as we can reconstruct them with their stories and symbols and praxis and implicit answers to worldview questions. <clears throat> in particular, he seems deeply concerned with the Jewish scriptures. How did he read his Bible? Did he actually, did his actual practice in using scripture tally with the claims he makes about Abraham, the law, and so forth? How does he relate to or engage with hugely important Jewish matter markers of sacred space and time, like the temple on one hand and the Sabbath on the other? Equally, how does he relate to the larger pagan worldviews of his day with their own stories, symbol, praxis, and answer? So what N.T. Wright is saying basically is like, we don't need to import our worldview onto Paul or onto Moses and then begin to work through a text because for Paul he had a big giant temple that that he had a lot of experience at that he was thinking about he had Sabbath that was massively important he had dietary restrictions that he was coming out of he had um, this story that he was caught up in of ex of the exile of the Jewish people and the desire to get back to the land we don't have a lot of those things. We're Christians already. So, and, and, and like in America, we have the Statue of Liberty. We have maybe, uh, you know, a, a state house, like a, a Capitol building, say in Texas, where I'm from. Those are, that's what's shaping us. We want to get into the stories and symbols and problems of the first century world before we get to the modern world. Um, next slide. So when you're when you're in the ancient you, you know when you're in the ancient Near East you you are much more inclined to think about God's presence as as being with associated with a temple as as if you're a Jewish person your story if you're in the New Testament is one that you're still in exile that you, the land you're in you're you're still not going you're still not blessed you're still under Deuteronomic curses in the land that you have this messianic hope um, that you're still trying to figure out what covenantal obedience looks like when you don't govern yourself. You're trying to figure out what does election look like. Um, these are all the things that Paul begins to rework in light of Jesus Christ. And so we want to be thinking about those things as <clears throat> we're in the text. Um, think about relationships, masters and slaves, and and Paul and and churches and power dynamics there, kings to subjects. 
um, think about worldviews of, of pantheons, of gods and temples everywhere. In America, we don't, you know, there's not a lot of temples around. You know, I mean, we don't have we don't have household idols. We don't have trinkets. We don't cast spells unless you're weird like those things just aren't happening in the ancient world. It was everywhere. Every Greco-Roman city, you went in and you stopped at this God and you gave this little offering. And then if you went into someone's house, you paid homage to the household gods. You burned incense to Caesar. All spaces were sacred or defiled, depending on if you were a Jew or not a Jew. We just want to pay attention to those things. We don't have to be cultural experts. We just have to realize that their world was very different than ours. Next slide, please. So this is one of the most important things we can can think of when we're engaging the text. And that's our cultural value system. I'm speaking for people in the West. I'd love to hear people that, that aren't from the West if your value system is the same. But our cultural value system is largely one of who's guilty and why are they guilty and how can you become innocent so that you're not punished. And, and that's, you're just trying to maintain your innocence and get away from your guilt. The Bible, however, <coughs> does not share that as their primary cultural value system. The ancient Near East was a, a value system that had guilt and righteousness in it, but it had honor and shame dynamics everywhere. Because everything was built on reciprocity. Thing, you, you did this for someone in a, in a higher status so they would take care of you. Um, there was all of these reciprocal relationships. You were trying to maintain your honor, escape your shame, because those things were limited good in the ancient world. And so <clears throat> some, some parts of scripture, when Paul's talking about honor or, or avoiding shame, for me, I got to pause and go, well, that's a big deal to them, even though it may not be a big deal to me because I don't deal in those cultural dynamics as much. Um, in some places in the world and, and like in the book of Colossians, fear, power, freedom dynamics are everywhere. Because in a lot of cultures where animism or spiritism is a big deal, you're going to have people that are afraid of, of demonic powers or animistic powers that are, are causing – uh, havoc all over their lives, and they want to figure out if God can protect them from these powers at B that that they think are controlling them. So fear powers a big cultural systems. Now all societies have an interplay of all of them, but the but the Bible is primarily honor shame much more um, than the other two. So just need to be aware of that. And I'm going to go really fast because we are running out of time. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to hit on this, and then I'm going to I'm going to keep going. Uh, just the highlighted. So uh, the big thing here is to realize <coughs> that every communication, every every communicative attempt, does does the primary has a primary purpose of trying to move someone's emotions, trying to change or strengthen ideas, and trying to affect the behavior of the person. If if you're not doing that, the communication is pointless. Nobody says things for no reason. We call those people crazy. Um, And so we have to understand that when we're reading the Bible, it is not so we can just gain more information in our head. That is not why the biblical authors wrote. So what we want to do is we want to understand the patterns that the authors are using to accomplish one or all of these tasks. Remember, the Bible is written for change not for information, um, for us to change. Okay, next slide. So I touched on this earlier. Exegesis is not a linear process. It's not you look at the culture, then you look at the grammar, then you look at the history, then you look at the whatever, okay, because the culture affects the grammar. The, The cultural moment and the historical moment are tied up in the the meaning of words why because we we process word meanings with pictures called mental representations so when someone's talking to me about a temple i'm thinking about the temple the 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 hindu temple down the street the biblical author was thinking of, was maybe thinking about the temple of apollos or maybe they're in jerusalem and they're thinking about the jewish temple so <clears throat> we have to uh, make sure that we are doing exegesis 
in more circular, like we're looking at grammar and, and history and culture and grammar and history and culture and grammar and history and culture together. Um, and here's the best way to do this is you start at the top, like we said already. You want to get the big idea. And then from the top, once you have the big idea, you then we can begin to get into the parts. We go into sections, and then after the sections, we get into smaller parts. And then if you get to a place where you just don't understand a word, now that you have the overall discourse context, then you can begin to do word studies. Um, next slide, please. So what is what is a genre? Okay, G genre simply is just uh, the form of language in communication. Um, it's it's that simple. Really, this slide is just for y'all to read later. But just just know this: genre affects how we process the discourse. When you think about it, we read poems with different expectations than we read stories. We read a letter with a different expectation than we read a newspaper. So we want to make sure that we understand that what genre we're in because the genre gives us like processing instruction. It's like the instruction manual, right? You don't get an instruction manual for a bike and apply that instruction manual to your car, do you? No, because they're different. Same thing. You don't get you don't take genre processing instructions of a of a poem of a psalm where it's parallelism and a lot of times it's it's repetitious parallelism in different ways and try to apply that to Paul's letters. That it doesn't work. So make sure that that we know that genres matter and how we're processing the discourse. Um, next slide. So I, I basically let's go to the next slide. Sorry. So those are literary genres. Text genres or discourse genres are are basically genres that that have to do with meaning. Okay, and and I, this is we we were going to cover this in the Colossians study that's coming up. Um, so I don't really want to hit on this because it's a little more complicated. But I think this is one of the keys to unlocking the text uh, at a deeper, more meaningful level. Um, because these are these are genres that when we look at a text, um, we're we're looking to try to figure out how is the author structuring his discourse so that we will get the intended meaning, um, and and so text genre will really help us do that, especially with Paul, because most people think Paul's letters are all about his theology, when really Paul's letters are all about his persuasion to change. Um, Okay, next slide. So when we're working with a paragraph, here's some good questions to ask. Where where are we? Where are we in the overall discourse? If it's a story, if it's a narrative, when is it happening? Um, who is being talked about the most? Like who's the primary actor on stage? Is it Jesus? Is it Moses? Is it the Pharisees? Who is it? Um, where are the themes changing? How does how does one start one part of the discourse start and the other part finish? Because the biblical author is going to help us transition from one place in in the discourse to the next place. And then what's happening? Who's it happening to? Why is it happening? And what's the communicative goal? Next slide, please. So um, when you're working with paragraphs. These little connective words are so vitally important. And I want you to think about them like this. And I just gave the English here. But these connectives, they're like signpost for your, for your discourse so that you don't get lost. Connectives don't really carry meaning. They just, they just help you process what's already there. So in other words, if you have, um, <coughs> you know, Bill went to the store. Um, Bill bought milk. Then the connective, you we know basic the basic meaning of those two propositions. The connective helps us figure out how the propositions work together. How are we supposed to think about these propositions together? So when you come to say a for or a because, what that is signaling to us is that it is strengthening 
the um, the argument. It's not moving the discourse forward. When you come to an and, it's what it's saying is, hey, what what came before is really really close. I want you to think about these things together. Um, a therefore, is is it's resuming something important in the discourse because of some principle that needs to be said. So pay attention to the connectives. They are very helpful for how to process discourses. Here's a great example. Everybody and their dog thinks that that the theme of Romans, of the book of Romans, is Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for the power of God. Now, the problem with thinking that that is the theme is that the gar there in the Greek, the for there, signals to us that it is strengthening or supporting a preceding clause. So what I actually think, and I, and I wrote a, a paper on this in a, in a doctoral class on Romans, I think that 113 and 14 and Paul's desire to get the gospel everywhere is the theme of Romans. Now, the gospel being the power of salvation is important. But look, if you have a Bible and you're in Romans, look at all those fours. Look at all those becauses, 116, 117, 118. And, and you go from 116 to 117, and then in 118, there's a theme change, right? You go from the righteousness of God to the wrath of God, but it's still supporting why Paul wants everybody to hear the gospel. Those connectives are important. They matter. So pay attention to those. Um, next slide, please. So when you're uh, when when you are working say with Paul in a paragraph think about the kinds of statements he makes and why he's making them in every paragraph in Paul there is going to be a main idea a big idea and there's going to be supporting statements Paul may be supporting um his main idea by by credentials by talking about himself or the other believers by giving them enabling ideas like you're bearing fruit you're you know you're enabled with the power of the spirit of god something like that um he he may be motivating them to work out their salvation with fear and trembling he may be explaining something to them it, all of that will support the main idea which is usually some kind of command and now inductive and deductive reasoning is just simply paul could state the the command first and then support it or paul could launch into supporting all support 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 in all these different ways building up to giving us the command so when we begin to see this we begin to see paul's thought flow we begin to think like paul all through his discourse and that's what we want to do because we want to get as much as we can, we want to we want to walk right behind Paul, seeing, okay, why did you say this? Ah, you were strengthening your argument here. Oh, you were so talking about them in this way or yourself in this way because you were about to ask them to do this, or you needed them to change this this way of thinking or this behavior, and it really opens up Paul in these new fresh ways, and it, it it's amazing. Um, next slide, please. Um. So we're going to skip Psalm 1 because we're, we're running out of time. Um, but I would, I would challenge you to, um, I would challenge you to read Psalm 1 and read it all the way through and, and get a big picture idea and, and email me what you think the big picture ideal is. Because there is one main idea in Psalm 1. There, that is one sermon in Psalm 1. Um, okay, so, Exegesis. Now we get to the exposition part, right? Next slide, please, Jalen. Thank you. Um, it's the so what. Y'all, if you read your Bible and you don't get to so what, then you you have not you, you have not completed the task. Okay? Better you have if you have ten minutes, you read five minutes and you ask so what of the passage. And you and you dwell on that, then read for 10 minutes and do five word studies and look up five words in your concordance and your lexicon and never get to the personal application. So how do we move from then to now? Picture it like this. You have the ancient context. OK, um, and then you have this bridge and we call this the bridge of truth. This is the transcendent truth bridge. 
And so the transcendent truth bridges the ancient context and the modern context. And what we want to do is we want to go from the ancient context. We want to walk over that bridge of transcendent truth, that truth we get from the text that applies everywhere in every way, and then we want to apply it to our lives and the lives of our family. So <clears throat> what do we ask? What's the transcendent truth in the passage? Why do I even need to know this truth? What am I going to do about the truth I've learned? Um, next slide. When you come to the word of God, I invite you to, to be willing to receive what the word of God has to say to you. Um, here's some reasons why we don't. Here's some reasons why we don't. Um, we have unrepentant sin in our lives. Um, we, we have things like apathy, which is unrepentant sin. Um, we're not doing exegesis, so we're not getting to truth. We're not, we're not trying to understand the biblical author. We're, we're just trying to get something out that we want as opposed to listening to what God has to say in his word. And, and one of the biggest ones is we just don't trust what we learn. We, we come across a promise of God. I will never leave you or forsake you. And we say, eh, yeah, but what about this, God? But what about that? These things will cause your Bible study to become stale, to become unfruitful, and, and you will gradually stop reading your Bible. We have to come to the to the word of God with open hands and open hearts. Um, next slide. So if you're teaching or you're preaching or or you're you're leading your family or you're you're doing discipleship, here's some things that you want to help people reflect on as you get into the, as you get into Bible study. Um, and this is great sermon prep. Um, is there something I need to confess? Is there some place? in my life where I'm sinning against God and I need to repent? What kind of conflicts or problems or temptations am I facing? Um, <clears throat> and how is the passage that I'm in, how can it speak to that? What resources do I lack or, or what, am I, what resources am I, am I holding onto and not giving to God? Um, you know, what, where is God's spirit moving in my life? Where is the word encouraging me? Um, Next slide. So, so that was a that that was a fire hose of information. I understand that. Um, but what I'd love to do now is is just go into you know ten twelve minutes of of Q and A. So if you have questions, if you have a text you want to look at, if you have something, um, then please uh, you know fire away. May I make a comment? Yeah. I thought it was taboo to listen to the Bible on audio, that I wasn't really studying my Bible, you know, if I wasn't reading it. But because of certain circumstances, I had to start listening to my Bible on audio a lot more often. And it helped me helped me tremendously because I started seeing the big picture, whereas when I read it, even if I read it from beginning to end, I didn't comprehend it, but when I heard it, and then I could listen to a book like five, 10, 15 times, um, it, it really helped me see the big picture. So for me, listening to audio really helped. And I don't mean it doesn't mean I don't read or I don't study, but that, that was a blessing for me. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great way if you're in the car, if, if you are working out and you're short on time, yeah, Give it a listen. That, that most of the early church was not reading their own little scrolls; they were listening to the word being read to them. Ah, this is Deborah. Will you please repeat the assignment for Psalms one? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would just invite y'all to read Psalm one as a whole, um, as one discourse. Read it and read through all of it, it's very short, and come up with the big idea. Because Psalm 1 goes from, blessed is the one who's not, you know, walking in the counsel of the wicked and standing uh, with sinners and sitting in the seat of scoffers. Why? Um, because his delight is in the law of the Lord and, and you know, and, and on the Torah really is the word there in Hebrew. Um, he meditates day and night and he'll be like a tree, you know, planted by streams of living water. And then it goes into judgment. 
And so a lot of people are like, wait, does this make sense? Absolutely it does. But we just need to read it, all of it together. Get the big idea, and then we work and see how the parts fit the big idea. Maybe we have to change our big idea, and that's okay. But when the parts match the whole and the whole match the parts, then we can be really confident that we've understood the intended meaning of the text. Because God's right. coherent. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh-huh. Come on, I know y'all got some questions. That was a lot of information. So when you're thinking about when you're thinking about say a story and and meaning in a story you're th we're thinking about imitation and emulation of the main character so when you're when you're looking at <laughs> at a gospel then a lot of times Jesus isn't going to say things I'll answer that question in just a second. Jesus isn't going to say, you know, he's not going to give us theological propositions the way Paul does. So we've got to read between the lines and realize that, again, in the ancient first century, disciples, they would call it, got caught up in the dust of their rabbi. Why? Because they were walking so closely behind their rabbi, watching and learning and imitating. And so when we're reading the Gospels, the intended meaning there a lot of times is caught up in what Jesus is doing because it would have been common ground knowledge that whatever the master's doing, the disciple needs to do as well. So do we need to be good at Greek and Hebrew to 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 be close, to do accurate exegesis? Um, so you're talking to a language professor. OK, so I'll be a little biased. And yes, languages help because it removes one more layer that we have to decipher. But you can you can do fantastic exegesis by just reading your English or whatever language if you're if you're if you have a Bible in your primary reading language by just carefully reading and listening um, to what the text is saying and and, re and not reading with your own presuppositions. So yeah, you can do great exegesis, but you have to pay attention to genre. You have to pay attention to genre because that will give you the processing instructions you need to say, get through a story the right way, as opposed to a letter. I, I mean, think about it like this. When you read a gospel, okay, this is Jesus's whole ministry. Where does the last week of his life s start in the gospels? Like when you think about proportionality in a story, the last week of Jesus's life is proportionally greater than everything else said. When you think about the Gospel of John, the first 12 chapters are all about the three years of Jesus's ministry or three and a half years. And then he's devoted three chapters and a prayer to discipleship. Everybody says the Gospel of John is all about evangelism. But, but wait a second. I think it's about eternal life and abundant life like John 10, 10. Because th think about how much ink the story is giving to particular scenes and situations. There's a lot of people that know Greek and Hebrew real well that don't pay attention to anything else but words. And so they, they, miss, they miss the forest trying to really understand what each individual, each individual tree is like. Yeah, how would I know I got the right, like, you know, exegesis or understanding, came to the right conclusions of a passage? So, <clears throat> one, I check, check with commentaries. You know, like, don't be afraid to look after you do all of your work. Look at a couple different commentaries and see what they come up with. Ask some friends, see what they come up with. But that is one reason why, at Grace, um, we we are we are pushing for people to look at the top from the top down and the bottom up because what what we know what we're assuming our presupposition is god is coherent 
he he's not going to give us a discourse that doesn't make any sense and because of that the the parts should fit the whole and the meta theme of the whole should should help make sense of the parts and so if you if you are tracking along in the book of exodus and and you are and you feel like you know exactly what the book's about and then you come to a passage and and you're exegeting and it's like hey i think that this is all about israel being polytheistic well then we know we know from the from the from the big picture of exodus that that won't be the case so the parts fit the whole the whole fit the parts and then we can be we can be very confident that we have the intended meaning of the text That's why we do exegesis in a circle. We don't do it in a linear in linear steps. So we're constantly adjusting, and that's a good thing. That's a great question. Can you help us uh, in the application portion? Uh -huh. You have there are three questions. What is the transcendent truth? What should I know about this truth? Why? What I am going uh -huh. to do about what I have just learned? Let's give a specific uh, a discourse, basically in Acts chapter 10. Uh -huh. So the way I the way I read it, this the transcendent truth. Correct me if I'm wrong, is mm -hmm. that the gospel of Christ is for everyone. Mm -hmm. So if I'm if I'm teaching this in a small group that I'm ministering, uh, how 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 do I encourage them? Uh, answering by answering this the second question and third question why should i why should i know this truth and what i'm going to do about it uh, what i have just learned can you help can you help us uh, uh, absolutely question? absolutely so so think about think, think about the discourse context of acts chapter 10 I, I just preached through the book of acts we just finished um in in when you read the entire book of acts acts chapter 10 the, the same theme of Cornelius and the Gentiles goes from 10.1 to 11.18. That, that is how much ink that Luke spends on the Gentiles getting the gospel. Why? Because Paul's about to, he's about to ex expand and elaborate on that. Now, Acts 1.8 helps us understand that that's where it's going, right? You'll receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses everywhere. Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth. So we know that that's the big that that's a big theme of Acts. So in in your own context, there will be people that you're ministering to that will have people in mind that they do not want to take the gospel to. And 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 just like Peter, who the sheet comes down, remember, and and Peter and Jesus says, Peter, get up, kill and eat. And and Peter says, No, I, I've never done this. Y you're challenging everything I know to be true, Lord. Because the gospel is has to expand, and so you may have people in your culture and your con discourse context, or sorry, your 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 ministry context, that say we don't go to those people. Those people will never hear the gospel. They'll never change. They're never they'll never believe. And so what I would say is is the first thing that you that you could do about understanding that yes, the gospel is for everyone is begin a a time of prayer with your enemies. Or for your enemies, or for people that that are looked down upon uh, in your in your culture, wherever you're at, I, I think that would be a good start. Uh, uh, follow up. How about how 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 should this truth about uh, that you have identified in this in Acts 10 uh, uh -huh. uh, will uh, help us as 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 Christians to make a difference in the lives of the people we are ministering, applying this, the truth that we, we, we have here in, in Acts 10. Well, the, oh, the gospel, yeah. The, yeah, the gospel comes with it. Inherently, the gospel comes with it, blessing. And so if the gospel is for everyone, then the love of Christ is for everyone. If the love of Christ is for everyone, um, which it is, then then the the gospel message should cause us to want to go and be a blessing to everyone in our community, regardless of their social status, regardless of their cleanness or uncleanness, regardless of their shame or their honor 
or 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 whatever it may be, the gospel puts us all on level ground. And because what we have a tendency to do as people is to compare ourselves to others so that we we feel better about ourselves or have more honor in ourselves. And what the gospel says is, nope, nope, it, it, you're all level at the foot of the cross and at the empty tomb. So we have to go. Um, we have to be willing to bless our communities, regardless of if they have nothing to offer us. Okay, so in other words, if I'm going to make a difference for God uh, in this world, I have to, I have to, I have to hear and believe in the gospel before I could go out and reach out and share it to others. Is, is that right, Pastor? I mean, I, yeah, I think so. I, I mean, I, of course, you, yeah, hearing and believing the gospel is the first step because at that point, the spirit indwells you and you have the power to live a life that you didn't have a power to live beforehand. So you have the same spirit that indwelt the Lord Jesus now indwells the believer. And so, yeah, the first step is to trust the gospel and to believe the truth about about to see people the way Jesus sees people. That's the first step. When we begin to look at people the way Jesus looks at people, everyone changes. <laughs> Thank you. Great questions, Richard. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Jason. Hello. Um, I believe that wrong interpretation leads to wrong application. So can you help us uh, interpret for everyone's uh, information and say James chapter 2 verse 26 exegete James chapter 2 verse 26 because many believe or some believe that uh, this verse uh, that that without works faith is dead so can you help us uh, exegete on this uh, yeah absolutely so um, if, if you have a Bible then go to James chapter 2 it's very simple, and lots of people overlook this. Um, and this is why looking at discourse structure matters. Because um, James is talking to believers. And he's he asks the question, what profit, what benefit, my brothers, if if someone says they have faith, but they don't have works, is that faith able to save the person? And then he gives an example of how um, a, a faith that is not being acted out is useless. It doesn't help anyone. And so you have a comment in 17, and this way also the faith without works is dead in itself. Now, dead is... Is a, is a metaphor for separation in the Bible, right? The prodigal son was dead and now he's alive. Dead's a metaphor. Um, but in this context, we, we immediately jump to save means save from hell and dead means you have a dead faith. The problem with that is that he defines dead. He defines dead in 20. In verse 20, <coughs> he says, Oh, foolish man, don't you know that uh, works or that faith without works is arge? Arge means to be idle. It means to be useless. It means to have no good effect. It doesn't mean that it's not there. It means there's it's not doing what it was intended to do. So then he goes back in 26 and says uh, without, you know, Faith without works is dead. So you have faith without works is dead. You have the example of a faith that's not working. You have faith without works is useless. And then you have positive examples of how Abraham um, and Rahab put their faith to work. And now here's where situational context matters. Uh, James is not talking about judicial forensic righteousness like Paul. James is talk about, talking about a righteousness that comes out of the Torah, conformity to God's standards. And so this passage is, is doing what every other part of James is doing, and it's giving us wisdom. Here's how to live wisely. 
live out your faith. Put your faith to work. Where do we see that? We see that in the beginning of James, and then we see that moving up into this passage where James says things like, be a doer of the word and not merely a hearer of the word deceiving yourself. So we need to understand both the situational context of James writing Jewish wisdom literature to the church and also that righteousness doesn't just mean <laughs> justified in the Pauline sense of granted eternal life. It, it, it means it has many different connotations depending on the context. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. So that, that means that works is not part of salvation, and works is a um, listen then Sharon justify your salvation. I, I, absolutely. We work works comes out of our faith. We want to put our faith to work, but remember that God is the one who's already put the works for us to do beforehand. Remember Ephesians two ten? So works works that God has already given us to do are not going to justify us. James here is saying, look, you have to be wise. He starts out with don't show partiality to a poor brother. You know, if a rich brother and a poor brother enter, you want to show them the same. Why? Because you're functioning off the law of Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and he continues that that theme. And then after this, he talks about how wicked the tongue can be. He's still talking to brothers. In 3.1, he says, my brothers. And then he goes to three at the real, at the real heart of the discourse with earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. Here's heavenly wisdom. And then he gives another rebuke of believers that are living for their own interest. And then he finishes up the discourse. So the problem with saying this is all about justification is that it doesn't fit the rest of the discourse. So this part doesn't fit the whole. So we need to go back and look at the whole of James and see how this part fits the whole. Does that make sense? He's not gonna be talking to believers everywhere and then all of a sudden use cryptic language to say that if, if, you're not, if, you're, if your faith doesn't accompany works, you're not really saved. Because that would mean, dead faith would mean you had a live faith. So can, can you kill your faith? No. You can't. But also remember, deliver, deliver, save, sozo in the New Testament can mean save from a bear, save from a lion, save from a flood, delivered from an evil mailman. I mean, it can it can mean all kinds of things to get someone um, out of a harmful situation. Don't read into it some kind of eternal life idea when it's not there. Yeah, thank you. We're just uh, pointing out that to um, for everyone's information that word study is very important. Thank you. Yes, but not near as not near as important as looking at the whole discourse. Because if you just did a word study, you may come to the conclusion that you can lose your salvation or you could have never had it. When you look at the whole discourse, you you have to come to the conclusion that this has to fit the whole as a coherent discourse, and so it can't be about saving you from hell. Because James never talks about it. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, brother. Um, One more question. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Peters. Um, yes. Uh, re in relation to James uh -huh. and uh, what you, you, you taught us that um, um, exit – when you exige this is something that is uh, circular not linear exegesis yeah so that means you have to you have to take into consideration a lot of things so like mm -hmm. uh, in james uh, uh, mm -hmm. correct me if i'm wrong is it right to say that you have to know who james is talking to so like he's talking to believers mm -hmm. so if they're Absolutely. believers they have already been saved so definitely right. you are not talking about salvation and the uh, the word that he used like um uh faith with no works is dead just simply means it's useless if you have faith and then you do not live that faith in your life because um the, um uh, this um 
uh, the letter of James causes a lot of confusion among those mm -hmm. who read the the Bible. When uh, so it's it's very it's very important. Um, I mean the um, even though this is just a one hour thing, uh, it 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 uh, helps to make things clear that you have really to see a lot of points, be aware of what was there in the ancient world so that you will you will be able to understand. So I was also confused before, but uh, uh, it's nice uh, going at grace that we learn how Fantastic. to do it. And I think uh, your course, I'm with your class. Um, uh, it, it, it becomes clearer to me now. Good. On what and, we and would want to achieve in uh, in exegesis on Colossians. Thank you so much, Dr. Peters. Oh, absolutely. So one more. Uh, so I'll just close this comment, Steph, is you don't have to even get use the Greek to get to the proper meaning of dead. You just have to look at the structure and the overall discourse because you have an A, dead, dead faith, idle faith, dead faith. If James had meant to say dead, remember, choice always implies meaning. James had a choice there. He could have said necros again, but he said arge. He could have said dead three times, and we would have gotten the message. But he puts it, he sandwiches arge in the middle. And why does he do that? Because he's helping us define what dead is, because dead is used abstract here. Arge is used in a concrete way here. The other thing, remember, look at the discourse structure. You have the negative example of someone who has faith and says, oh, I hope you get warm and I hope you have a full stomach even though you're, you're, you're naked and you have no food. Bad example, useless faith, good example. He reiterates the fact that you need to work out your faith. Why? Because he's already told us that we wanna be doers of the word and not merely hearers of the word. Why? Because we wanna live wisely in this world. It all fits together. Great questions. Thank you all so much. Um, I, I think at, now's the time. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Is that cool? Steph, is that is it? Yeah, is it time? Yeah. You can go ahead and close us in prayer, and then we'll go ahead to the announcements right after. OK, fantastic. God, we love you. And uh, we thank you so much for every person that um, was on the call tonight. Um, was on this webinar and those that couldn't make it, I pray you'd bless them abundantly. Um, Father, with your love, with your truth, with your mercy, with your grace, and I pray that they would exalt Jesus um, in their, wherever they're at, wherever they're doing ministry, wherever they're living life as a believer, I pray that you'd bless their families. And Father, I pray you would give us a hunger for the word. I pray that you would give us a hunger for to be doers of the word and not merely hearers of it so that we would not be deceiving ourselves. And God, I do pray that our faith would not be dead, but we would put it to work for your glory and for your honor, and so that more and more people would come into your kingdom and have eternal, abundant life. And so I thank you, God, I pray this time would, would have been a blessing to people, and, and I thank you for Grace School of Theology and Grace Center for Spiritual Development and the opportunities that we all have to learn together in this global context. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Let's go to. All right. Thank you, Pastor Peters. Um, thank you for sharing this evening, and thank you to everybody that uh, has joined us, uh, whether you're here or anywhere around the world. Um, we've been blessed by, uh, by this this evening, and we look forward to hearing from you again in our near future. Um, if you enjoyed this and you learned from it, we encourage you to take a look at our courses, um, and please consider pursuing a program at Grace School of Theology. Uh, you can find all of that information at gsot.edu. You can also access all of our resources for personal and group growth on that website as well. Um, we also offer a number of courses on Grace On Demand. That is our online uh, platform run by GCSD. Uh, you can get personal training at any level, including certificate courses. Um, and all of these resources are also available on the GRACE app. Lastly, we do want to remind you to sign up for the six-week Know This Exegesis uh, workshop. It is June 21st through July 26th. It's going to be every Tuesday 
from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Central, uh, and that will be with Pastor Jason Peters. So if anybody else had any more questions or anything, um, he will be able to get to all of those questions and all of that. Uh, you can register at graceondemand.org backslash no that dash this dash exegesis. Um, also, with this QR code, you will get a discount uh, when you sign up or you can use Colossians 20 uh, as your promo code. So thank you everyone for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, and if Jason is here, he can also talk more about what to expect with the Colossians course for new this. Um, this is just like a this um, exegesis webinar that we have right now is just a taste of how important exegesis is. And in this workshop, it's just um, we we're accepting a very very limited number of students for this workshop because it's really going to be an interactive, hands-on experience to try on how to apply all these principles on exegesis that we learned today. And we're going to use the book of Colossians. So Jason is, as you can see from this whole night, that he's very much an expert. Like you throw him Acts, you throw him James, Colossians. He is able to really bring out what um, the text really means to the original audience. So um, we'll use the book of Colossians, something that Jason has studied very much so that you can really be able to practice exegesis and also apply that to different books of the Bible. So um, if Jason, you would like to further share more about their expectations for this course, you can go ahead and share. If he's still here. <laughs> Yeah, you can you can all um, check the link. Jay, in the sorry, chat. Jason, the, unmute your mic. Yeah. Yep. The the beauty of this course will be that you it will be completely interactive, so mm -hmm. it will not be a lecture. Um, we will be walking together through a uh, Colossians, and by the time we're done, you are going to own this book. You're going to be able to teach it. You're going to be able to preach from it. If you do biblical counseling, you're able to use it in your biblical counseling. It'll be it can be your go-to book for discipleship. Um, all of those things, uh, it, it, it'll. I think it'll be a really big blessing just because of the unique format of it being completely interactive. You can ask questions whenever you want, and we will stop and we'll answer those. So that's why we're taking a limited number of people, and it, I think it's really going to be an amazing, um, an amazing time. Definitely. So um, again, we do have this discount code. Um, we'll just show the QR code again. You can scan that or you can input the Colossians 20 this discount code upon checkout if you click the graceondemand.org front slash no this exegesis link. So since you attended this webinar, we're giving you a very exclusive 20% discount so you can really enjoy um, learning exegesis with Jason. Okay, okay so... Um, that's it for our time today. Thank you again so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you again, Jason, for imparting your knowledge with us. And I hope everyone has a great night or great morning to whatever part of the world you are. Thank you, everyone. Yep, thank you, everyone. Y'all have a fantastic morning or evening.